All right. Uh, I think I've introduced myself to most of you already, except the folks in the back. Hello, welcome. I'm Stan Love. I'm a NASA astronaut, and I want to tell you, talk to you today about uh, flying in space. Uh, the format is going to be, I have a video that's about 18 minutes long. Most of it is silent, and I will narrate it. There are some bits with sound that hopefully will be exciting and interesting. Um, and then after that, I've been asked to just talk briefly about my career path from being in school like all of you uh, to standing up in front of a stage in a blue flight suit. So I'll sort of describe what my career path was like so you can see what a possible route to a job in space could be. And then I think we're going to have about a half an hour uh, after all that for uh, just give me your questions and I will answer as best I can. So lots and lots of time for you to find out what you want to know about space rather than what I think you want to know about space. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and run the video. So I flew in space on the space shuttle Atlantis in 2008. That's our mission patch. Our job was to take the European Space Agency's Columbus Laboratory up to the International Space Station and install it. There we are getting into our flight suits on the morning of launch. That's Steve Frick, our commander, a Navy, US Navy test pilot. Our shuttle pilot, Alan Poindexter, also a Navy test pilot. Mission specialist number one, former NFL football player and NASA engineer, Leland Melvin. Mission Specialist number two and lead spacewalker, Rex Walheim, a colonel in the U.S. Air Force. Mission Specialist number one from Europe, Hans Schlegel, an astronaut who'd flown in space about 16 years previously. There's myself, looking a little nervous, can't imagine why. Uh, getting ready to go fly, and there is Leo Ayart, a general in the French Air Force. We had two European crew members on our flight. Here we are walking out of the crew quarters in our flight suits and getting ready to drive out to the pad. We ride in an aluminum RV, Caravan, I guess you call that here. Um, here we are getting into our seats. The only people within three miles of this fully fueled rocket are ourselves, the flight crew, and the seven folks in white there who are our strap-in crew. They're going to get us into our seats, get us all strapped in, ready to go. Then they're going to leave the launch pad, and then we will sit there for about two and a half hours as they count down the rest of uh, the countdown and get ready to launch. There's uh, Rex getting into his seat. Down on the mid deck, Leo and Hans, and then myself in the center. So the shuttle flight deck had two decks. The upper deck is where the controls were, and then there were a couple more seats downstairs. So this is actual sound, what, what we, as we heard it inside the shuttle getting ready to launch. Main safety systems arm. The water is to prevent the sound of the engines from tearing apart the concrete launch pads. We run the engines for a couple of seconds to make sure they're good. Then we light the solid rocket motors. Once they're on, they cannot be turned off. Seven seconds, Steve. There's the roll. Steve. Wow. So we roll to put the shuttle on the correct course toward the International Space Station's orbit. That's looking down the side of the stack with a camera on the external tank. In a minute, you're going to see a little blurry line, diagonal line, come across the screen. That's the shock wave as we pass the speed of sound. After two minutes, the sh uh, solid rocket motors are burned out. That's from a camera on one of the solids, watching the shuttle pull away from it. Five minutes into the flight, we're above the atmosphere now. We roll to put the communication antennas on the top of the shuttle so they can point at the communication satellites. And after eight minutes, we've burned all the propellant in that big brown tank. We're in orbit. We can cut off our engines. And as I mentioned earlier, we're going 17,500 miles per hour. Gravity's still trying to pull us down to the Earth, but we're going forward so fast that we fall toward the Earth as fast as the Earth curves away from us, and we remain in orbit. And your first thought is, wow, this is cool. I'm floating in my seat. And your second thought is, I have to get to work right now. So here we are getting out of our seats and getting ready to go to work. Our first job is to take photographs of that external tank. A previous shuttle flight had a piece of foam insulation fall off that tank, hit the shuttle's heat shield, and put a hole in it that we didn't know about until the shuttle tried to reenter the Earth's atmosphere and it was destroyed during entry and uh, that crew passed away. Here we are opening up the payload bay doors. And we will pull out the space shuttle's robotic arm built by the Canadian Space Agency. And with that arm, we are going to grab a 50 foot long boom with a bunch of cameras and sensors on the end of it. And we're gonna pass that boom along our heat shield. So here we are picking up that boom. 
and we're going to use that to inspect our heat shield to make sure that it did not get damaged during launch. So we can swing it into that boom into position, and then we scan the entire shuttle's heat shield, or at least the parts we can reach with the boom, to make sure that we didn't pick up any damage during, uh, during ascent. <clears throat> So that's Hans looking out the hatch window and making sure that I'm, I'm running the arm at this point. Hans making sure I don't bump it in anything. If I do, there'll be paperwork. Also early in the flight, we're getting ready for the first spacewalk of the flight, filling up our drink bags, preparing the suits for work. Then on the third day of the flight, this whole time we were been circling the earth 16 times a day, slowly catching up with the International Space Station. On the third day of the flight, we actually meet up with the station and dock. We are both going 17,500 miles per hour. But when we meet up, we want to be going this fast so that we don't uh, make a colossal bump. This is footage shot of us from the space station as we approached it. They're using the cameras now to uh, look at the uh, bottom of the heat shield part we couldn't reach with that inspection boom to make sure that that was in good shape. <clears throat> and this is sped up. You're not actually going over the ground quite that fast, although it does still look pretty fast. The shiny tin can in the back of the payload bay, that's the Columbus Laboratory module that we are adding to the space station. Here's a shot of the space station as we see it from the shuttle. Now flying up to the space station, Rex here with the laser rangefinder is helping Steve know how far he is from the station, how quickly we're approaching it. This is from a camera on the station as we make that final approach. Space station weighs 400 tons. Space shuttle weighs 100 tons. Uh, Steve on the left there is flying it by hand down an imaginary corridor four inches wide to make sure that those two docking mechanisms line up properly. So. The camera's on the shuttle. You see the space station coming down as the shuttle approaches. Those two docking mechanisms will match up. Good job of flying by Steve. Some latches will engage to hold them together. Then we crank those two sections together to make a tunnel that we can then pressurize with air and then float onto the space station. Peggy Whitson was the commander of station when we got there. It was her birthday. We brought her a space shuttle and a $2 billion laboratory. Pretty good birthday presents and hugs all around. We're the first fresh faces that they've seen in four months. And Dan Tani over here on the right, we were his ride home. And because of some problems with our fuel tank before launch, we were two months late. So uh, he was really anxious to get home and see his kids. So he was very happy to see us. Also, they knew we had ice cream. At that time, they didn't have a refrigerator or freezer on space station, so we could bring up ice cream in an insulated bag. And so they're like, hugs, hugs, hugs. Yes, can we have the ice cream now? So uh, after we're done greeting, we have a nice dinner and dessert. You can see Dan up there in the corner. He's been in space for four months. He knows how to use even the corners of the rooms, whereas us new kids are all on the ground, feet down, heads up. Even though there's no gravity, you could, you could use the whole room, but we're not used to it. He is used to it, so he can use all that space. Now we're getting ready for the first spacewalk of the flight. So we're talking carefully through every step that we're going to do. And then uh, Steve, Dex, and Peggy are getting... Rex and I into our spacesuits, and there they are loading us into the airlock. I was hoping they'd issue me socks like Peggy has, but they didn't, so I'm still disappointed about that. And that's me in the airlock, because they're just getting ready to shut the hatch. Then they shut the inside hatch, pump the air in the airlock back into the space station, open up the outside hatch, and it's 200 miles down to the Swiss Alps, and it's time to go outside and get to work. So our first job was to prepare the Columbus Laboratory so that the station's robot arm could grab it and then pull it out of the shuttle payload bay and stick it on the space station. So we had to pull off a couple of debris shields um, that protects the space station against orbital debris and install this. This is called a grapple fixture, and that's the thing that the robot arm grabs onto to pick up that 30,000-pound laboratory and move it. So we had to install that on the Columbus, and that's me on the end of the robot arm putting that grapple fixture into place. And then we had to drive bolts to secure it down. And then once the grapple fixture is on, we had to bolt that on pretty tight because, again, it's a 30,000 pound laboratory and you have to pick it up through that fixture. And there we are working, putting those uh, debris shields back on after we'd installed the grapple fixture. You can see the earth uh, passing behind. Most of the time on a spacewalk, your eyes are full of your work. You've got structure right in front of your helmet and you can't see where you are, but occasionally you can look up and see, oh my goodness, look at, look at where I am. Here's Hans, uh, that object in the front is his safety tether. It's an 85 foot braided steel cable uh, attached by a locked hook onto the space station so that if he does let go, that's your first mistake, 
he still has a safety tether so that he doesn't float away into space. If he does float away into space, he's got a little jet pack on his back. He can fly himself back to space station. This is now the second spacewalk. During the construction of the space station, we had to do a lot of work changing its thermal control system. Space is like a thermos bottle, and a space station has a lot of equipment in it, and that equipment generates heat, and you have to get that heat overboard or everybody will roast. This is a nitrogen tank that we use to pressurize that thermal control system, and we're pulling out an empty one from the station and putting in a fresh one that we brought up on the shuttle, and then we took the old one home to be refilled and then taken back to station. When you're outside on a spacewalk, you basically lose all your IQ points. Uh, that was Dex reading us every single step in the checklist that we had to do. So you don't have to memorize what you're doing. You just have a friendly voice on the radio reminding you what to do. Uh, there's the Columbus uh, installed on the space station and Hans crawling around on it and a view from his helmet camera looking down at the earth when he has a moment to appreciate his surroundings. The third spacewalk, we added two scientific instruments to the outside of Columbus. Uh, there was a solar telescope and then a materials exposure experiment, putting a lot of materials out to see how they do in low Earth orbit. That's Baja California going by underneath, if you recognize the outline. So we had to pull those big experiments out of the shuttle payload bay and then stick them onto Columbus. That's me on the end of the robotic arm and Rex floating around up there. This is sped up quite a bit. The arm moves very slowly. We do everything in space very slowly because it's safer that way. And then here's Rex and I taking pictures of each other. We also brought back a, one of the four 1,200 pound gyroscopes that the space station uses to keep itself oriented in space. One of those had failed several years ago. Uh, a fresh one had been installed since then, but we brought the old one back so that it could be taken apart so they could figure out what was wrong with it, rebuild it, and send it back up to space station as a, as a spare. So rewinding the clock, as soon as we got that grapple fixture put on Columbus, uh, Leland was able to grab it with the arm. Dan and Leo are helping him. Then, and again, this is sped up. We go super, super slow here. We're moving big, heavy things around each other in zero gravity. Uh, they don't have windows, just camera views, and Leland is using the station arm to pull the Columbus lab up out of the shuttle payload bay, then swing it over to the side, and then there's an automatic sequence where the arm reconfigures itself to move the Columbus lab over the docking port that will attach it to space station. So that's the automated sequence there. We bring it in the last few centimeters. at which point some latches grab it and pull it in just a little bit more, and there's that. And then there's a ring of 16 powered bolts around that interface that drive to hold the two modules together. Then we can open up the hatches and Peggy has a new room on her house. Here we are installing some floor panels. They're wearing goggles because when you manufacture anything, there's metal chips left over. And then when you get it up into space, they start floating around. You don't want to inhale those or get them in your eye. So you wear uh, eye protection for the first day or two until the ventilation system can clean out all that floating debris. And there's Hans installing the first science experiment in Columbus. When astronauts have spare time, which isn't often, their favorite thing to do is, is look at the Earth. The Earth is the most interesting thing in space. There's the Caribbean Sea with the amazing blue colors of the sea there. After a hard day's work, it's time to go to sleep. You can sling your sleeping bag on the floor or the wall or the ceiling. Put on your eye shade and earplugs, try to get some sleep. And if you don't do something to restrain your arms, um, you end up kind of doing this zombie walk thing as my commander's about to demonstrate. Wait for it. Yeah, so the natural position for your arms in weightlessness is this. So after about eight days docked to the space station, it was time for us to come home. Hugs all around. We made sure Leo was on the station side of the hatch. Dan was on our side of the hatch, shut the hatches, depressurized the tunnel, and then the shuttle and station undock. Dex will be the shuttle commander on his next flight, and he will be the one flying that docking down that four-inch imaginary corridor. So he gets a chance to actually fly the machine in space himself before he has to be the prime person. And, the, and he does that by flying a loop around the space station after we undock. As we fly around the station, we're pointing all our cameras at it, click, 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 taking as many pictures as we can so that we can return that data to the engineers 
and so that they can understand how the space station has changed. Maybe it's gotten little orbital debris hits. Uh, just see how it's doing. And there's Dan looking at what was his home for the last few months. All right, that's supposed to be an exercise bike, but that's not how we're using it. You will never see anybody doing that on the first four days of flight because your stomach's upset, but then after that you feel pretty good and then you can play with the. Your mom's not there to tell you not to play with your food, so we do. That's me trying to find a clean shirt in my clothing drawer after 12 days in space. Uh, I brush your teeth at the end of the day, uh, but there's no sink to spit it in. So we spit our toothpaste into a rag and then we hang all the rags up in the toilet. So it has a like minty fresh smell. And we have a chance to just sort of enjoy a little bit of time off being with our friends and coworkers in space before it's time to come home. So here's Steve flying a flight simulator of the shuttle getting ready for landing. The shuttle lands as a glider. You got one chance to put it on the concrete. Otherwise you're in the swamp with the alligators. And that's not an exaggeration. There are a lot of alligators at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We get our suits on. I was the suit up guy helping everybody get strapped in. And then I had to get into my own seat. Then we do a little burn of the shuttle's engines to just barely slow us down from that 17,500 mile per hour speed. And that's enough to dip our flight path down into the atmosphere where drag against the atmosphere is going to slow us down to something more like a reasonable airplane speed. That is looking over the shuttle's overhead window back at the thousand mile long trail of plasma we leave behind us as we come into the atmosphere. The leading edges on those wings will be up at 3000 degrees Fahrenheit from the heat. That's the double sonic boom that the shuttle makes as it comes in over Florida at Mach 3 at 70,000 feet altitude. Down below, you're seeing what, the, what Steve is seeing out his window. The green numbers are a heads up display showing altitude, airspeed, and an overlay for the runway that shows us where to land as we came through the clouds. Now that overlays is on the runway. That means our navigation is good. The shuttle dives at the ground at about a 20 degree glide angle. An airliner comes down at a three degree angle. This is what you would have heard if you were at the end of the runway as the shuttle came in. Remember, we're not burning any engines here. That sound is just the wind rushing by the landing gear. We landed 240 knots or so, about twice the speed of a jetliner. So again, that's not engine noise, that's just wind noise. Nice touchdown on that runway. That runway is three miles long. Plenty of room. We throw out a drag chute. So if you just touched down and stood on the brakes, by the time the shuttle came to a halt and all that energy of motion was uh, in the brakes, we'd probably catch the tires on fire. So we use a drag chute to slow down and then we uh, jettison that at 60 knots and then slow down and come to a stop right on center line. Then we have about an hour to kind of get used to gravity again. And then it's a time to walk around, shake hands with everybody at Kennedy Space Center who helped make our flight safe. Get used to being on our feet again. Everybody's looking a little wobbly. They said, don't walk under the shuttle after you, after you land and then look up because you'll probably fall over backwards. And Steve and Dex are both Navy test pilots and precise flying is really, really important to them. And uh, you can see here, here's Dex critiquing, critiquing Steve's landing. See, he's not quite on the center of the line. He's off by about four inches. Could have done that a little better. Then one last smile for the cameras. And then it's time for us to go back to crew quarters and see our families who are very happy to get us back. And that's the end of the video. All right, let me get a quick drink of water and then I will be happy to take your questions. Oh, let's talk about career first, hang on. All right, you guys are in school and I bet most days it feels like a drag, but uh, this is the preparation for what you will do in your life. Uh, and there are some amazing things that you can do with your life, but it depends all on what you're doing right now. So um, I went to a public school and I think in the United States, that means a private school here. I'm not sure. Anyway, it was just where all normal kids went. Um, elementary, then it was called junior high at the time, grades uh, seven, through nine, seven through nine, and then grades 10 through 12 in high school. Um, at that time, I thought science was really cool. I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up, um, but I did know I wanted to have something to do with science. So when the time came to choose a university, 
I chose a place called Harvey Mudd College, which I will be shocked if anybody in this room has ever heard of. Um, it is a very tiny school in Southern California. It likes to uh, put itself in the same class with Caltech and, and MIT, two of the most important science schools in the United States, but nobody there has ever heard of Harvey Mudd either. Um, I actually went there because the brochures that they sent out to uh, graduating high school seniors were funny. So they had a sense of humor, so I thought that was cool. And I decided to major in physics. So I took my university degree in physics because that is the basis of just about all science. From physics, you can go into biology, chemistry, engineering, a wide range of things. So for somebody who doesn't know what they want to be when they grow up, but who thinks science is cool, physics is a really good place to start, although it is also extremely difficult. Um, so a lot of people talk about the wild times they had in college. I didn't have any wild times in college. I had to wait for graduate school. But fortunately, the college was so hard that it prepared me so well for graduate school that things were a little bit better in graduate school. There's a, there's a comic strip in the United States called PhD, which is what we call the doctoral degree. But there's, a, there's another um, uh, interpretation of those letters as piled higher and deeper. And the author of that uh, this is a comic strip about graduate students, people with a university degree who are getting more advanced degrees. The author of that comic strip uh, visited a bunch of colleges and universities. And when he went to Harvey Mudd College, he says, the only place that I found where the college students were not afraid of graduate school, because they said nothing could possibly be worse than this. So I finished with a degree in physics, uh, looked at a couple of jobs. None of them looked interesting, but I was accepted into the graduate degree program at the University of Washington, which is not the best school in the United States for astronomy, but it's you know in the top 10 or so, so not too bad. Um, so I went up to Seattle and got a master's degree and PhD in astronomy. Still didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up, but I thought space was cool. So I studied space. And about that time, I discovered that with a PhD in astronomy, there are no jobs. Um, it used to be in the 1960s that with a PhD, you could immediately walk into a professorship at a university, and that would be your career for the rest of your life. But that was in the 1960s when the colleges and universities were growing very fast. Uh, the graduate program works by you have a professor who is a mentor for graduate students as they go and get their PhDs. And over the course of their career, that professor might train 10 or 12 new PhDs, and then they retire and leave one job opening. 10 or 12 replacements, one opening. You can do the math. Um, so I started looking for other jobs. Uh, while I was in graduate school, I had the chance to take some classes in other fields. I thought airplanes were cool, so I took some aerospace engineering classes. And this is something that you can do in a university, is you take the classes that are important for your degree, but you can learn other things too. And I highly recommend this, because in the future, even now, people are less and less staying in the same job for their entire careers. And it's going to be more and more important for you to be able to learn a bunch of things so that you can change careers uh, and still thrive. And that's what where being in school gives you that preparation to be able to learn new things, not just do, be good at what you know, but to pick up new things quickly so that you can change when the conditions change. So I finished my PhD, there were no jobs. I applied for lots and lots of jobs uh, as postdocs, which is sort of the holding pattern for those 10 or 12 people in excess of the one job opening. Uh, low pay, um, you have to move every three years to a new institution, it's very difficult. Uh, did a postdoc in the University of Hawaii. Well, that wasn't too bad. Uh, another one at Caltech, and then I got tired of being a postdoc um, and got a job at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is the NASA center that controls all of the robotic spacecraft that go out and explore the planets. And that was a blast. I was having a really good time. But about that time, the seven applications that I had sent to the astronaut office finally came through. I was invited to interview to be an astronaut. That's sort of the step before astronaut selection. They interview about 120 people, of which they'll hire maybe 10 or 12. Um, so I got an interview. They said no. I got a couple years later, I got another interview. They said no. A couple years later, I got another interview, and that time they hired me. So this was 1998. Um, by then, I, had a, I was married. We had a child. We moved the family to Houston, and I've been there ever since. A couple of very good pieces of career advice that I'd, I'd like to pass on to you. Um, the first, this won't be important to you unless you get to university and go and get an advanced degree. 
but my thesis advisor told me you're, you can think of your PhD as one of two things. Number one, it's a license to continue doing your dissertation project for the rest of your life. Or number two is certification that you can go from being an interested layman who knows nothing about a subject to becoming one of the world's experts of it in a couple of years. And I've looked at my PhD as that, so I don't use, I don't use my formal education most days in my job, um, but I'm really glad I got the ability to learn new things. Um, another great piece of advice is uh, I didn't do super well on my astronaut job interviews until after I took a job interview workshop. So a job interview may be the most important single hour of your entire career, and you can train for it. When the time comes, if you're, if you're in university or even in high school, they'll have the opportunity you know, to sit with a bunch of other people who are getting ready to go look for jobs, and you can practice what to do in a job interview. There's only about 40 questions they're ever going to ask you in a job interview, and you can be ready with really good answers to that, or you can go in cold and go, oh, I don't know, and then they're not going to hire you. So... When you get ready to interview for jobs, take a job interview workshop. It'll make it go so much better. And in my case, after I took that workshop, I went down, took my third astronaut in interview, and I knew I'd hit it out of the park. And that was the year they hired me. So that's probably more than you needed to know on careers. So let's go ahead and cease that discussion. And I think I have a little over half an hour. Uh-oh, she's looming. I'm here just to help. With oh, okay, she's going to help. Help with questions. Okay, do you want to you pick the victims? Can All right. Pick, so I think there's probably going to be a flood of hands after that amazing presentation. It was wonderful to see all of the all of those videos. Absolutely incredible. And I imagine there's a whole load of questions in this room from burning minds. So okay. just raise your hands. We will do our best to get around as many of you as we can. If you're online, pop them in the Q&A box. I've got some people over in the corner who are checking that all for you as well. So hands up and we'll come round. Someone's going to bring a microphone to you so we can all hear you. So you just have to pause while someone runs to you. So let's start right at the back on the corner there. We'll start with you. It's coming. Yeah, it'll be on in a second. Okay. My question is, is there, has there ever been a time um, when you were in space, were you bored? <laughs> Was I ever bored in space? No! <laughs> you are working like a maniac the whole time you're in space and then trying to get a few hours of sleep. And then if for some reason there is no work to do, whoop, over to the window and watch the amazing Earth go by underneath you. No, there is, there is no chance for boredom in space. No. Oh, and by the way, um, so I can answer questions about space exploration, human space flight, and you're lucky today your astronaut who knows about flying in space as people is also an astronomer. So I can answer all sorts of questions about deep space and black holes and neutron stars and all that good stuff too. Probably with more words than you ever wanted to hear. So let's go for the next one, just on the end there. And then Angus, if I could do a ground to the middle at the back for the next question. Did you want to be an astronaut when you were also little? Yes. When I was six years old, the uh, Apollo program was flying astronauts to the moon, and I watched all those. I, one of my earliest memories is from first grade when I was six years old. They wheeled the, the TV on the tall cart, black and white television set. You guys don't know what that is. Black and white television set on the tall cart so we could watch the Apollo 16 splash down, and I just thought that was cool. I had a little tin lunch pail that uh, with astronauts and stuff on it. So I always thought space was cool. I loved science fiction, Star Wars, Star Trek. Um, but it wasn't until I was in college that I realized that this is a job you could get. Lovely. In the middle with the white head scarf. There you go. There you go. Uh, hello. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask what made you pick such a job that was quite busy and quite hard and that you could get lost in space? It's cool. Everybody hates that, but that's really the truth. Space flight is really, really cool. Uh, and I have to explain this too. When I told that to my wife, she thought that I meant that if I did it, then I would be cool. And she didn't know me in high school because I was like the least kid, cool kid in school. But I just think space is really interesting and it's worth the effort. And in fact, it's so interesting that I hardly even notice the effort because what I'm doing is, is so engaging and so amazing. Um, even if I wasn't flying in space, and most of the time, you know, I've been an astronaut for 25 years, I've spent two weeks in space. But the whole rest of that time, I'm doing things that are amazingly cool, and I just love it. 
Um, and that's something you ought to keep in mind when you're looking for your own career. Look for something that is so interesting and enjoyable that you don't notice that it's work and you'll be much, much happier. But excellent question and thank you. Great advice. Right down in the middle here. Wait for the mic. Back, back, back. It's all right. In the, okay, green. the green coat. Uh, How many people can you fit in a space shuttle? How many people can you fit in the space shuttle? Once they flew a crew of eight, normally we fly as a crew of seven. And even though it's smaller inside than a minivan, because you can use the whole volume instead of just the floor, you really don't feel crowded. Just a row in front of you. How did you? How did you eat if there's no gravity? How did you eat if there's no gravity? Carefully. So most of the food that we get, since there's no refrigerator, uh, the food is stored in, in like plastic pouches. And so what you do, if you have like a steak, which would be a slab of meat in sauce in a pouch, you carefully cut the corner off and the sauce doesn't squirt away unless you squeeze the bag, in which case you're going to spend the next half hour cleaning up after yourself. You see, oh, you open up very carefully and then some of the sauce kind of crawls out, but there's still surface tension that holds it together. And you kind of suck all the juice out and then you can cut the rest of the top. You don't cut the top off because then that goes floating away and it's a problem. So you leave it attached and then you carefully squeeze the meat up and take one bite at a time. Um, you saw Leland playing with candy. It's okay as long as you make sure you clean up all your candy. Uh, but most things are in a pouch or in a thick sauce. And another reason for sauce, by the way, if you fly in space, the most valuable thing you can bring with you is hot sauce. Um, when you fly into space, your, your body was not designed for this. Your body was designed for 1G. And there is a system mostly in your legs that is always trying to pump fluid out of your legs so that your ankles don't swell. And so that's always working, pumping fluid uphill and you get into space, the gravity, there's no gravity. And that system keeps working and it pumps all the fluid into your upper body. And uh, it makes your head kind of swell up. Now, this is awesome if you're not 20 years old like I am. It makes all your wrinkles smooth out. It would actually be a really good spa treatment. Um, but with all that extra fluid in your head, it's like you've got a very bad head cold. And all of your food tastes like cardboard. So astronauts love hot sauce. They put hot sauce on everything. And if you ever see a picture of astronauts eating, there's always going to be like at least one different one type of hot sauce. When I flew, it was Tabasco. Uh, the modern generation uh, is more into sriracha, so they've got sriracha on the table all the time. So hot sauce, that's the thing. But the thick sauces help keep stuff together so that it doesn't go floating away into the cabin. But very good question. Amazing. Just down here on the end. Is the Earth really round? Is the Earth really round? Yes. That's all I have to say. So uh, orbits wouldn't work if the Earth were flat. You'd go up and then you'd come down, right? Because the Earth has to curve away from you as fast as you fall to it. Otherwise, you hit it. Well, we didn't hit it. We were up there for two weeks. And um, also, separately, I have been three times to the South Pole. And all of those flat Earth models have a dreadful problem near the South Pole. And really, there was the South Pole marker. And on the other side of it was just more snow. And it just kept going. So yes, it's really round. On the end, just there. Yeah. What's the best thing about being an astronaut? Best thing about being an astronaut? That is a tough question, but one of the best things is coming out and talking to kids about how cool space is. <laughs> um, we are very privileged to get to fly in space. It costs the taxpayers a lot of money to send us. Um, and most of those people cannot or ever will get to go into space. Although you guys are lucky you're in a time when space travel is becoming more and more accessible. So many of you may get to fly in space by the time you're my age. That would be awesome. But this is my best way of being able to share what other people have sacrificed for me to be able to do back with them to, to let them know what it is that they bought. Amazing. I think we've got a couple of questions from online, which is oh, where we're going to yeah. just pop to next, and then we've we'll come back into the room in a moment. We've got tons of questions coming through online. Uh, quite a few astronomy, but we'll go for the, for the first one being, is the spacesuit very heavy? Is the spacesuit very heavy? The spacesuit weighs 350 pounds. In space, of course, it weighs nothing, but it still has the inertia of 350 pounds. So inertia, imagine if you had a 350-pound block on ice or on wheels or on an air hockey table, 
it still takes a lot of force to start it moving. Once it's moving, it keeps going. If you need to stop it, though, then you have to exert a lot of force to stop it. So the suit, although you don't feel the weight of it in space, you still have to fight it to start it moving. You have to fight it to stop it moving. You have air inside the suit and none outside. The suit is pressurized, which means that every time I close my elbow or try to close my hand, I'm fighting against air pressure. So it's like trying to squeeze a tennis ball every time you close your hand on a, on a tool or on a handrail to move around. Uh, at the end of a six hour training session in the neutral buoyancy lab where we do all our practice, I can barely close my hands on the steering wheel of my car to drive home. It is that exhausting. So uh, the suit is heavy. And even though you think it doesn't weigh anything, it's a lot of effort to work in that thing. Future ones will be better. Uh, Al's class from Summerfield would like to know, is it easier to see stars in space? Is it easier to see, see stars in space? Uh, it would be if you were out in space by yourself, but you wouldn't get to enjoy it. Because the vacuum would have you unconscious in seven seconds and brain death in three minutes. So you are always looking at the stars through glass. And on the, on the inside of a space station, that glass has about four layers to hold the pressure, to stop meteorites, to stop ultraviolet light. Um, and it's a little like trying to look at the stars out the window of an airplane at night. You know, there's lights inside, there's reflections from all those layers of glass, and you really can't see very much. The only way you can see the stars is by turning off all the lights inside, and sometimes that's impossible. There's computers and things that you need to leave on. So the view of the stars is actually kind of disappointing. It's a little better outside in a spacesuit because you've only got two layers of glass. Um, so when you're around the night side of Earth and the sun is blocked, you can see it a little better, except that when you're out on a spacewalk, every single camera and light on the outside of the spacecraft is pointed at you because you're the most important thing going on that day. And so you're always under a lot of light. So you're much, much better off in a dark place on Earth at night for viewing the stars than you are from inside a spacecraft or inside a spacesuit. Good to know. So we'll come back to the room. There's still plenty of questions. Oh, <laughs> good. Oh, so many people to go to. Uh, who's where? So let's go somewhere. Okay, so on the front row, the green. Yes, you, my love. How nice did it feel to move around? How did it feel to move around? Yeah. yeah at first, it's very hard. Um, you have to use your hands to move around instead of your legs. Your legs are almost useless when you get under zero gravity. So if you're trying to do any work, you got to hold on with one hand and do the job with the other. And if it's a two-handed job, that becomes difficult. So it takes a few days to sort of learn how to use your body again. Also, your sense of balance gets messed up. you got some little tiny, actually little tiny stones inside your middle ear attached to nerves, and they tell you which way down is. And when you go into space, those don't pull on those nerves anymore, and your sense of balance is completely gone. And the way your body decides to react to this is by throwing up. I don't know who designed this system. Can't tell which way down is, got to throw up. So for the first few days in space until your body gets used to it, everybody feels kind of sick to their stomach. And you get the same thing when you come home. But after a few days, you know how to move again and your sense of balance has figured out what to do. Um, then it starts feeling very natural and you can kind of swim around like a fish. It's, it's worth doing. I hope you get a chance to do it. Second row, just here, yep. Yeah. Why are some of the um, spacesuits orange and some of them are white? Oh, good question. Those are two different spacesuits. So the orange suit, we called it the pumpkin suit for the space shuttle. That is a suit only for launching and reentering the atmosphere. And its main job is to keep you alive for a few minutes. If the space shuttle suffers a leak on ascent, the cabin, the air is leaking out, then we're gonna come back and land as soon as possible and the suit is airtight, it will keep you alive. Or if you have to bail out of your spacecraft into the ocean, for instance, it's got a parachute and, and a, a life preserver unit built into it. Um, so it's kind of a survival suit. And it's orange so that the Coast Guard can find you. <laughs> if you're floating in the ocean and wearing a blue suit, that's not super good for the rescue forces to be able to see you. If you're wearing an orange suit, they can find you. It's also got a radio beacon on it, a bunch of other things. Plus, if we drop astronauts into the ocean, trust me, the entire armed forces of the United States of America have nothing more important than getting the astronauts out of the ocean. The, but that orange suit, if I, if I leak out the cabin to vacuum, I'm basically a starfish. That suit is pressurized, and it's not built to let me move my arms, close my hands. It's just to hold the air in. 
the white suit is built for work in space. It's got a big backpack on it. It's got a much larger air tank and the joints and the gloves, especially the gloves for making your hands work. Hands are super complicated mechanically. Uh, anybody who's worked with robots probably knows that a human hand is way better than a robot hand. But anyway, trying to make a pressurized glove that you can actually do handy work in is super hard. So that suit is built to not just keep you alive, but allow you with great difficulty to do a little bit of useful work. Excellent question. Second in command to the back. Uh, do you do research on things like neutron stars? And if yes, if you know what neutron stars do you do research on? <laughs> so uh, I don't do research on neutron stars. As an astronaut, I have jobs that are very focused on people flying in space. So right now, my main day job, I design computer displays and switches and hand controllers for future spacecraft with a degree in astronomy. Huh. But good thing that in school, they taught me how to learn new things. So, uh, but before I was an astronaut, I was an astronomer. I was studying planetary science. So asteroids, comets, uh, meteorites. So I didn't do neutron stars, but if you are psyched about neutron stars, the thing to do would be to go get a degree in astronomy. And there's tons of interesting research on neutron stars going on right now. I don't know it very well because it's outside the field that I used to have, and I haven't been an active scientist for some time. Right down here at the front. Um, I, do you still like keep in touch with the people you're on the mission with? Absolutely. Um, when you fly in space with someone, you're, you are sharing an incredible experience that almost nobody has. Plus, when you're assigned to a mission with your crewmates, you work together with them, you live in, the, you're in, put in the same office with them, and your families get super close, and they're like your best friends for life. So yeah, we see each other every year at a reunion, and we definitely keep in touch. It's, it's um, being in danger together forges bonds between people like almost nothing else, and we share that, and it remains with us for the rest of our lives. Lovely. So the back of the green row, third or fourth one in, if you can get in there, Claire. Okay. okay. Has, there, has anyone ever been lost in space? Has anyone ever been lost in space? So no, uh, we are pretty good, especially during a spacewalk of staying attached to the space station. There have been, let's see, 14 plus four makes 18 people have died on space missions. So, um, Soyuz 1, the very first flight of the Russian Soyuz spacecraft, was returning from space, and the parachute failed to open. So that capsule didn't parachute softly to Earth. It hit hard, and that uh, cosmonaut died. Another Soyuz mission was returning to Earth. They'd done their deorbit burn. They were just about to come in the atmosphere, and a valve connecting the inside of the cabin to outside space accidentally popped open. That valve was located under the seat, so the cosmonaut couldn't reach it. I designed cockpits. We're not going to do that again. Um, and all the air leaked out, and that Soyuz landed fine on automatics with parachutes, um, but when they opened it up, unfortunately, they found all the cosmonauts had died inside. And then we've had two space shuttle accidents. One, uh, during ascent back in 1986, the shuttle had just launched, and there was a problem with one of the engines, and the whole thing fell apart, and those astronauts also died. And then in 2003, we had, an, uh, as I mentioned, with the piece of foam that fell off the external tank and broke the heat shield, and that shuttle burned up on entry and we lost those astronauts. We also lost three astronauts in an early test during Apollo when there was a cabin, uh, there was a fire in the cabin of the spacecraft when they were doing a test on the ground. They weren't even flying in space. But we've never had a person separated from a spacecraft and drift away and be lost. And we think about that all the time, every time we do a spacewalk and we really don't want that to happen. And you see it in science fiction movies all the time. I'm sorry, I'm gonna rant. It's gonna be a brief, brief rant. So, <clears throat> I'm on a spaceship, I'm in deep space, I'm doing a crazy spacewalk outside and it's the movie, so I'm not using a tether, I'm not being careful, I'm flinging myself from one side to the other, so I'm taking a lot of risk. And I float off into space and everybody's worried, it's as if I've fallen over, overboard on a ship and the ship keeps going. Spacecraft have engines and they have very precise engines, so I can just fly over and get that person. He doesn't have to drift off. I have loads of propellant. I have steering jets. I can, in fact, in the training for the space shuttle, 
uh, when you do what's called the, the rendezvous training flow, the practice that Steve, my commander, had to do to dock with the space station, one of the lessons is you've had an astronaut come loose from the shuttle payload bay and fly off into space. And we get taught specifically how to fly the shuttle right up to that person, fly the payload bay up underneath them, and they can grab something and we can get them back. So popular in the movies, but it's one of those things that makes me go, oh, face palm moment. Sorry, rant complete. Next question. <laughs> Uh, on the back row, fourth one in. Um, how do you use um, the toilet in space? Oh, no. All right. Well, at least we got through 15 minutes before that question came up. If that's the first one out of the shoot, I know it's going to be a long day. All right. So <clears throat> when you go to the bathroom in space, gravity separates you from your waste products. And we don't have gravity in space. So we have a little suction fan in the toilet that, that, per, that does the same job, but it's just a little suction fan. So for, uh, for what we in America call number one, liquid waste, um, there's a tube you go in and for females, there's a little cup that goes over the end of the tube so that you can not lose any droplets. Um, by the way, your first time you go to the bathroom in space, you should allot about a half an hour for that. <laughs> just you know, to make sure that you do everything right and allow time for cleanup, because it does happen. Um, for number two, the toilet has a pretty small hole. So instead of lining up with a great big old seat, you got to line up with a little hole. You got to make sure you get your alignment correctly, because everything needs to go in the hole. And then after that, you really, really hope that nothing comes out. Again, this is something you don't have to deal with on Earth very much. When the toilet backs up, at least it stays in the toilet bowl. Uh, on a spacecraft, you get um, what I recently, new term, we didn't call it this on my flight, but I just learned this one from other flights, and it's hilarious. Brown trout. OK. Um, also, if you're on a space tourist flight and you use the toilet and you make a mess, you clean it up yourself. We had a problem with one of the recent tourist flights where the billionaire was not used to cleaning their own potty up. And they left it for the space station crew to do, and the space station crew was extremely angry. So uh, toilet is difficult. Things sometimes come back out of it. It takes a long time to clean up. Um, we even have a little mirror so you can check back there and make sure there's nothing hanging out that you're not aware of. Uh, the last thing you wanna do is wipe your bottom with your shirt tail because you only have a limited number of shirts. Complicated, difficult, failure prone, leave lots of time, use lots of wipes. <laughs> right, we're just gonna pop for an online question. I think we've Okay, got after one. that one, the, the room is toast, so. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for asking it. It is important. This sort of comes back to the moon. It's to the moon. As how long does it take to get to the moon? And, and are you doing on the Artemis mission? Ah, so uh, you can kind of choose how long it takes you to get to the moon, but typically four to six days on a on a trajectory that is um, relatively quick, but also doesn't waste a lot of propellant. So you can kind of dial that depending on your mission design. Four to six days is a good number to keep in your head. And no, I'm not going on the Artemis mission. Uh, Artemis II is our next one. They're going to fly around the moon. They're not going to land on it. We're going to launch that in about a year and a half. And I'm not on it, but I have the second best seat in the house. I'm going to be the Capcom. So I'll be sitting in mission control next to the flight director. And the voice you hear talking to the crew on the radio, that's me. So if you watch that uh, mission, um, especially the launch and the landing, I'm going to be the, the lead Capcom for that, talking to the crew. I'll also, I'll also be doing shifts during the flight. Um, and I call it 80% uh, of the fun and 0% of the risk. What advice would you give to your 10-year-old self? What advice would I? Uh, OK, I think I've answered this question in another venue already this week. All right. Um, I was, you're not going to believe this because I look like I'm standing up here and doing okay. And I know there's people who would rather die than stand up in front of a room full of people, but I was one of those people. So I was very shy. I was very low confidence. Um, when in high school, when everybody else suddenly got a foot taller, I didn't until like college. Um, so two pieces of advice I'd give my 10 year old self are you're capable of more than you think you are. So don't be afraid to dream big. And the other is, since I was very shy and not good with people, social skills are trainable. You can learn to be better at interacting with people. It's a skill you can get if you just pay attention to it. So anybody out there who's a little bit shy and maybe doesn't want to put their hand up because they're kind of afraid, you can get better at this. You don't have to be stuck with it for life. Great advice.
Where should we go next? Uh, just right on the end of you, Claire, it's probably a quick one, and we'll see where else we go. If if you do black holes, what are the necessary circumstances for a star to collapse into a black hole? Oh, good question. All right. So uh, I know a little bit about black holes. I don't know a ton about black holes, but I know more than most of the other astronauts, so I can give you a better answer. Um, to get a black hole, you have to have a very massive star. We measure stars uh, in terms of how much material they have compared to the sun. The sun has one solar mass of material. When the sun eventually dies, it will blow off its outer layers, and the center of it will collapse to become a white dwarf star. That's sort of stage one of collapse of a star. A white dwarf star has about as much mass as a star packed into a space about the size of a planet. Um, a spoonful of that material would weigh a ton. A star more massive than the sun won't stop when it collapses to a white dwarf. It'll collapse down to a neutron star, which has about the mass of the sun packed into a space about the size of Milton Keynes. And a spoonful of that would weigh a million tons. And even that's not a black hole, although we're getting close. A star about 20 times the mass of the sun. When it collapses, it won't even stop at that neutron stage, but it will collapse down to identically zero size. Not just really small, but zero. We don't know of anything mathematical that will prevent it from collapsing into that. Um, but Mother Nature doesn't like zeros, so it hides them from us with what we call an event horizon, which is the region around that zero size, high mass thing where the gravity is so intense that even light cannot get out. So nobody knows what goes on inside that boundary. It's frightening things, quantum gravity, we don't know how to solve those equations. Uh, but you need a very, very massive star, uh, usually collapses in a supernova so that the core of that thing shrinks down to near zero size. Amazing. We've got just over five minutes left for questions. So I'm going to do my best. I can see there's so many hands, but I would do my best to get through as many as we can. So let's go down here on the front row. And then, Claire, if you make your way into sort of this front row of green, we'll go there next. Um, what would happen if a meteor had hit the like space station or the bigger space station? Oh, what happens if a meteor hits us? So first of all, meteoroid, meteor, meteorite. Almost nobody gets this right. The little piece of rock flying around in space is a meteoroid. The streak of light in the sky, it's a shooting star, is a meteor. And a rock that gets through the Earth's atmosphere from space and lands on the ground is a meteorite. So if a meteoroid hits the space station, I'll be super surprised because most of the stuff up there is not natural. The dangerous stuff up there is all the garbage we've left in low Earth orbit, orbital debris, and that's what we're worried about hitting the spacecraft. So uh, the space station is armored with a complicated shield that I won't take the time to explain, but it can stop an object up to about the size of a marble. So if it gets by a piece of orbital debris smaller than a marble, no problem, the armor stops it. We have powerful radars on the ground, and we're always looking up in the sky. And so objects bigger than about a softball, we can see from the ground. They all have catalog numbers. We track them. We track them out into the future, and we see, oh, that piece is going to get near the space station in about three days. We're going to fire the little thrusters on the space station, move the space station's orbit so that it arrives early or late for that rendezvous. But in between, there's a size range between a marble and a softball where it's big enough to get through the armor and it's too small to track and we just hope those don't hit us. If, it, if something like that does hit the space station, you get a loud bang, you get a flash, the air would go fog and the air would start rushing out through the hole. The space station is big enough that there's probably enough time to shut some hatches to that module and get in your Soyuz spacecraft and come home. Uh, the space shuttle uh, had no such thing. So if that happens, you get a big uh, puncture wound on the shuttle, you're probably not going to survive that. But the space station is big enough that it ha you would have enough time to shut some hatches and, and get in your rescue vehicle and come home. But that is the greatest danger facing astronauts in low Earth orbit is a hit from orbital debris. That was a great question. And that's a mistake I make. I keep forgetting that there are three different stages <laughs> and they're not all meteors or meteorites. Yeah. So Almost nobody gets it. It's all right. Get it wrong. We're, we are here to learn. That's the point. <laughs> right in the middle front. That's the one. Lovely. Oh, it's 
carry on. Anywhere will do. <laughs> Let's go to question. Yeah, hey, hello. How much money is it to go to space? How much money to go to space? Uh, I think for about $300,000, you can get a ride on a suborbital capsule that barely touches space. You get a couple of minutes of weightlessness. You launch on a rocket, but you don't go to orbit. Orbital flights of 10 million-ish right now, dollars. It's getting cheaper. And as we learn better how to reuse rockets and make these systems safer and more maintainable, the prices are going to keep coming down. It'll still be a plaything of the rich for a while, but once once upon a time, flying in an airplane was something only the rich could do. So we'll get there. Just over here in the green. Yep. What happens if an incident occurs and you are the last man standing on a spacecraft? Spacecraft. Then it's up to you to land it. You're the commander. <laughs> so. Uh, the space shuttle, it was barely possible for one person to bring the space shuttle back for landing. Um, there were some switches on the other side of the cockpit that would be hard to reach. A Soyuz spacecraft or a Dragon capsule can come back fully on automatic. So even if everybody's unconscious, we can still get them back. But generally, the yeah, if you're the last person up, you, it's up to you to get it, everybody home. Right in the middle down here. Hang on, wait for the microphone. I can see you've got a book. Uh oh yeah, so, written down. I'm, I'm worried. All right. Um, so what do you think about antimatter engines, the production of antimatter, and how would you use it to get it to get to Alpha Centauri in about 40 years in like cryocapsules? OK. Uh, first of all, cryocapsules don't exist. Eventually. <laughs> they, that's biology, though. I'm not sure it will ever work. Antimatter. So antimatter is a way to store a prodigious amount of energy uh, in a very small space. You could launch the space shuttle with a piece of antimatter the size of a sugar cube, okay? instead of that giant tank and all those engines. Uh, the problem is getting any useful work out of antimatter. First of all, making antimatter. Right now, we can make one atom of anti-hydrogen. <laughs> and it takes particle accelerators and vacuum traps and this huge infrastructure just to make one atom. Uh, to make amounts useful for rocket propulsion would take a technology that we don't have yet. And then when you react matter with antimatter, they are both destroyed and releases all that enormous amount of energy. The problem is it comes out as gamma rays. And I don't know how to build a thruster that works on gamma rays. I'm used to having some sort of gas <laughs> come out there. So you'd still want to use the antimatter to heat something or figure out how to get the, instead of gamma rays, to get like neutrons out. And you can direct neutrons, they have mass, you can get some thrust out of that. The problem is neutrons have no electric charge. They don't want to go where you tell them to, they'll go off in some random direction. And an engine that thrusts in random directions is not helpful for us. But very good question. Antimatter is probably the fuel of 500 years in the future, but we're totally not there yet. So um, we're gonna have to start with what we're for. Okay. One, one final more question. question. All right, thank and you. That was see, a good one. I can see all the hands. So what I will say is, if teachers want to collect these questions that we won't get round to, because there are so many in the room, you can email them to me, and I will do my best to get them answered if they're not going to be answered in this room. I can't yes. promise, but I will try. I, I but, must say, of all of the student audiences I have talked to, this one has had the most excellent questions and the most hands in the air. So thank you so much. Before we finish up, thank you so much for your good questions and your interest in all this. So one final question. I'm going to give it to you right at the back. Yep, yeah, that's the one. Lovely. I'm so sorry, everyone else. Were you, were you ever worried that uh, your space shuttle would crash? Yes. I'm not stupid. It's dangerous. That was one of the things that made it hard to sleep at night. I said, you know what? Here I am in my sleeping bag and I'm floating and this is pretty cool. And any moment an old Delta II rocket body could come bang through the crew compartment and that would be it. So yes, uh, those who are not a little, at least a little bit worried are not thinking clearly. <laughs> what an amazing final question. Thank you very much. So. Dr. Love has just said thank you to all of you for your amazing questions, and I'm going to echo that. But I think it's our chance to say thank you to Dr. Love. So if I could have you all just to give a, a massive round of applause to show your thanks. Thank you.